Welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about the universe and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Ettinger and Brian Brew, and we've come to the end of Judah's history, as it were, and we are going to do a little bit of a retrospective today, partially in response to the likes of Richard Dawkins, who like to look at the God of the Old Testament and say, so mean, so hateful, so vindictive, to which we say, what? <laughs> um, what What story are you reading? Because <laughs> we're looking at the history of Judah and saying, oh my goodness, the Lord is so patient. <laughs> so let's start at the beginning of the story, shall we? <laughs> well, we'll even, we'll even skip ahead. We won't even worry about the, the fall and the the fruit and the garden. We'll skip to the Exodus. Like that gives us plenty of material. <laughs> well, there's already plenty with the fall. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that would be enough, right? <laughs> I mean, but what's the big deal? It was just one apple, right? One bite. Mm. What's, um... Yeah. In an entire world full of other things to do. <laughs> they chose that. <laughs> Naturally, because of course they did. Yes. We'll see. God didn't give them enough freedom is the problem. He wasn't, mm. the, as one Marxist speaker said, the problem is it was the apple. Mm. Unjust distribution of goods. That's, <laughs> that was the problem. Wait, that was a serious what? Yes. <laughs> it, it was some kind of dinner, formal dinner thing. There was this uh, Marxist speaker and there was a bishop present in the audience. And the guy said, Bishop, you, you people have always had trouble fixing the blame. Adam said it was the woman, woman blamed the serpent, but I'm here to tell you it was, it is the apple. Ah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So get rid of How all the apples. How dare God hold out That's the answer. one yes. thing in Eliminate the all the apples, you know. <laughs> mm, you know get rid of, yeah. It's, see, and, and and although, yes, what we kind of plan to skip to the Exodus, but uh, it, it may do well just to, just to ponder here a second, because this, I think this is where everything begins. Well, this is where everything begins, because it's where everything begins. <laughs> if we side with Adam and Eve at this point and say, yeah, why didn't you share God? It's actually your fault, because you're obligated to share all your goods with us. You should not be withholding from us. That is, you should not be setting boundaries. What's uh, ours is yours, and what's yours is ours. In fact, what's yours is everybody's. If, if we can't see the problem there with such an attitude then there's really not much point in going further. How dare God condemn the entire human race because his servants, which is what they were, took a bite of fruit. No, it wasn't an apple, but you know, that's what people call it. I remember seeing um, an illustration or something arguing it was a pomegranate. <laughs> thought, uh, that's actually, interesting. <laughs> actually, my wife wrote a poem on that. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> Asking the question, could you have been the fruit? Um, <laughs> So, yeah, <laughs> right, right here at the beginning, we like Adam and Eve, like Satan in heaven, we, we, we have to reckon with who the God of the Bible claims to be. He claims to be original reality, underived, self-existent, eternal, sovereign, who into nothing, we usually say out of nothing, which is true, but also into nothing because there was no time or space, created something, temporal, spatial, material universe, by the word of his power. And, and that means everything's his. He owns it. He controls it. He's present in all of it. This is what Satan didn't want Adam and Eve to believe. You shall not surely die. Well, if God isn't that, then maybe you can make the argument that God is just one power among many. It's the universe, in fact, is self-existent, eternal, blah, blah, blah. And that the universe created whatever exists. And we're back into basic paganism. Um, the gods ran out, rose out of chaos and all that. This is why there are only two worldviews, either a sovereign, the belief in a sovereign God before whom all men must bow and to whom all men must submit, and who, though he is gracious by definition, that grace is sovereign. That is, he decides whom he will show grace to and whom he will not because it's his grace to give or not. It's not something we... We can compel from him. It's not something he owes us. We're the ones who sinned. We're the ones who rebelled against him. And Richard Hawkins and others like others of his ilk, 
wanted to throw that word in. Um, <laughs> it is a that's very never good a positive word. thing. No, it's, it's it's not. Um, <laughs> they hate God, who they say they don't, who they say doesn't exist, and um, so they can't tolerate this. The original, the original sin, they must justify. And from there on mm -hmm. out, they can't read the stories correctly because they already have it set in their hearts and minds that this God is a bully. Mm -hmm. He's he's maybe an older, more powerful thing in the universe than others, but there's nothing that gives him any rights to do anything. He should play nice by our standards. Which is well, funny it's... because they're so ready to deny God any rights while demanding their own, right? And and the other presuppositional half of this is where do these rights come from? You say God, <laughs> you say God is mean by what standard? Because you just eliminated, eliminated God from the universe as furnishing a standard for nice and right and loving and kind. So where where is the standard coming from? And even if you can find it written someplace in in the heavens, why should we obey it if it did not if it if it's an impersonal thing out there someplace or in our minds or something society has created? What obligates me to submit to this? Why am I bad or why is God bad? Because I don't let you have what you want. Even if I cut you in pieces, why is that bad if there is no God to say these things are bad? So it's a little well, then the answer for them. is we're God, so to speak. Yeah. We, we get to be the ones who determine reality. It's no mistake that there's a rehabilitation effort for Satan. <laughs> uh, in the public perception uh, that, oh, he's actually this this uh, bringer of enlightenment. That's, yes. I mean, that's what Satanists basically mm -hmm. claim. He's a non-existent archetypal enlightening influence on humankind. Right. Uh, I mean, even... Oh, I just blanked on the name. Good Omens. Yeah. Uh, Good Omens treats... The bureaucratic demons is basically bumbling buffoons. And then there's Crowley, the one who, spoiler alert for those who haven't read the book, gave them the apple, basically. Yeah. Um, he He's just this enlightened guy who loves the arts and his Bentley. And <laughs> the earth is really not all that bad. I mean, it's a lot better than the end yeah. of all things. Yeah. That's not really... Satan's paradigm <laughs> to be a, a British a British man. <laughs> Although I suppose the Irish would answer differently. Yeah. <laughs> no joke. But, but, get, but getting us to believe that Satan's paradigm is Satan's paradigm. Mm -hmm. I, I forget who wrote it, but there's a there's a quote, it may be in good omens, but it's probably someplace else. The prince of darkness is a gentleman. Uh. No, he's not. <laughs> Is he though? <laughs> he doesn't play by anybody's rules but his own, as his demons have no doubt found out over the millennia. <laughs> anyway, so moving on, those good observations, by the way, Brad, especially the yeah, Satan as in Lucifer as the angel of light, the enlightener. Mm -hmm, that's basically <laughs> a lot of the uh, 17th, 18th century um, cults and um, conspiracies. Any and Mormonism. Um, moving on, so. Of course, there's the whole flood thing. Oh, um, there was that. There was that. But when God looked, he saw that every thought of the imaginations of their heart was only evil continually. And at that point, he gave them 120 years to think it over. And they did nothing with it. They, When we read Jesus' um, summary of the time before the flood, some people read it the wrong way. They were marrying, they were they were eating, they were drinking, they were marrying, they were giving in marriage until the day the flood came away. And a lot of people say, look, they were doing evil. Well, in, in the sense <laughs> that they should have been seeking God and instead they were complacent. So if that's what you mean, yeah, there's nothing evil about eating and drinking and getting married. But I, what were they drinking? That's beside the point. <laughs> point is, <laughs> life was going on and it shouldn't have been. Life, life should have come to a halt and they all should have been prostrating themselves and begging God for, for mercy, and they just didn't, and they didn't know. They weren't even aware, although Noah had been preaching. He'd been on you know international news for 120 years, and um, they nobody repented. No one, no one raised their eyes to God. No one called on his name. They passed into eternity beneath floods of waters after God had warned them. How? Uh, when's the last time we gave anybody 120 years warning before we said, <laughs> okay, that's enough, we're done now? Uh, not that they hadn't had plenty of warning before, because Adam mm -hmm. had 
been alive for a very long time and had talked to a lot of people directly, many of whom were still alive, including especially Methuselah. So there was a witness the whole time, and a particular witness on a ticking clock, and they didn't care. All right, let's skip this ahead. Is good. <laughs> well, I mean, I don't want to let that go without noting that, you know, some would say, you know, why doesn't God get rid of all evil in the earth? Why doesn't he make everything perfect? Well, he did that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, yes, he did that. And he <laughs> saved Noah. <laughs> yeah. Like, th this is not something that has never occurred to God to, you know, eliminate the evil people in the world. He, in fact, did that. <laughs> <laughs> Moving into the shadow of the flood, God called, at this point, okay, there's the Tower of Babel thing. Let's just oh, yeah, go. That because, was because that wasn't all that bad. I mean... Yeah, not everyone can understand each other, but, you know, there are worse judgments. God didn't destroy humanity a second time. But in the darkness of that, there was very little faith left until God came to this man named Abram in Ur of the Chaldees and called him to serve him. Fast forward the history, although we could stay and talk about how wicked his some of his grandchildren, great-grandchildren were. We can think of um, Reuben who commits incest with one of his father's wives. You could talk about him, his father having multiple wives. You talk about Simeon and Levi who massacre a city. Judah who has his own sexual problems. The younger brothers who sell Joseph into slavery. And yet... And Ur and Onan. Oh, there's that too. <laughs> yes. Yeah, them. Why is it the so tame... So wicked that God is just like, nope, yeah, it, we're yeah, done here. Yeah. Um, why is it that Tamar always gets the blame? I think in this generation, Tamar would actually... Pre play pretty well. Mm -hmm. Because the other two seem to have been abusive after some form, and she's okay. pushed aside and fights her way back in. I think a lot of feminists would probably regard Tamar, while fundamentalists stare at her in horror. How dare she? If you don't know the story, you should find it. So one of the one of my wife's students asked her the other day, this would be a sixth grader, Mrs. Ettinger, what stories are there in the Bible that no one knows? <laughs> Interestingly, she did not go to the Tamar story, I think because she actually tells it. <laughs> uh, but uh, she went to the last few pages of Judges and about mm -hmm. the, the, the Levi oh, who cuts yeah. up his dead wife in pieces. Like, that's not in the Bible, is it? Yeah, that's in the Bible. Yep. Mm. We did an episode on that, right? Well, I'm sure it, yeah. we did, yeah. So anybody listening to the podcast has heard it at least once. And if you're all good, faithful Bible readers, you've read it many, many times. But there's a lot of people who don't know it's there. Because it's yucky. But anyway, um, moving on past that family, we need to understand that that family was under particular satanic attack because God had narrowed the channel of his covenant mercies, of his revealed grace, so the preservation of the Messianic line, down to one family. Satan now has a very limited target. He just take out one of these 12 guys, or all these 12 guys, and it's, it's over, game, set, match. But they end up in Egypt. Because of God's mercies, he does not destroy them all. There's a little bit of future consequences for some of their descendants. But by and large, they come fairly unscathed until the whole, um, there arose a, in Egypt a Pharaoh who knew not Joseph, and they are enslaved and made to, to build public works for the Egyptians. And then the Egyptians go further and try to kill all the baby boys. And, and here, God's mercies pick up in a very evident way, because we've only gone through one book of the Bible. We've, we just completed Genesis and mm -hmm. like two chapters of Exodus, and then God steps into visibly into history um, in a very powerful way and levels the most powerful kingdom in the world. He takes away their king, their heir to the throne, their army, their chariots, uh, all their slave labor, a good part of their tangible wealth, all their cattle, all their crops. Uh, he has, nobody can tell how many people died because of, of collateral damage because of all the plagues and the lack of drinking water for a week. I mean, they got nothing left, and God brings his people out of that. And although they are stretched at times because the first three plagues do touch them, and yes, they're abandoning the place they've lived as slaves, <laughs> you know, you know, why even look to... Uh, um, Oh, what's it called? Social justice. That's, I guess, the whole social justice book. Uh, the, par the Exodus has become the paradigm, as it was for um, slaves in the uh, antebellum South. You're thinking of liberation theology. Liberation theology. Thank you. Um, 
So I, I, even the world seems to think that the idea of God coming and rescuing his people is good, however they may define that and whatever they think is going on. So this is where the story of Israel as a nation begins. God brings them to the baptismal waters of the Red Sea, uh, feeds them and, and takes care of them, gives them water out of stone in the wilderness, and eventually leads them to Mount Sinai and gives them his law, this vast amount of of revelation of who he is, of what his nature is, and of what he's going to be doing, Ten Commandments, the tabernacle, the priesthood. But then there's that thing with the golden calf, because in the middle of this, God's people, while, while, the, while they're standing in the shadow of Sinai, and there's cloud, and there's tempest, and there's lightning, and darkness, and thunder, and earthquake, and fire, they actually become so used to this, so complacent, so hardened to miracle going on in their backyard that after 40 days of Moses' absence, they turn and want some kind of visible representation, some kind of cell phone to God so that they'll know what the next step is. Yeah, and, it's, it's almost as though there's a, I don't want to attribute to Richard Dawkins sins that he has not committed, but the, <laughs> the um, attitude yeah. that he portrays would be the one that says, well, you know, God showed up on the mountain with thunder and lightning, but what has he done for me lately? Yeah. You know? <laughs> well, two years ago, you were slaves, and now you're not. And um, so you've been 40 days without a direct spokesman, and you're just kind of antsy and restless, and that, in, that justifies somehow this orgy with this thing of gold. And there are the 3,000 that the Levites slay and others that fall in a plague. And then God makes them grind up the golden calf, put it in the water, and drink it. Mm -hmm. So that's really mean, and, and, and God is not treating these people with the proper dignity and honor they deserve, right? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Have we made the connection between the jealousy ceremony and the grinding up of the golden calf and making them drink it? Well, I have. I don't know if we've done it publicly, so go ahead. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so um, in the in the... In the book of Leviticus, right? It's in no. Leviticus? No, it's in Numbers. No, dang it. <laughs> Everything's in Numbers. Numbers gets way undersold. Yeah. There's so much cool stuff in Numbers. Yes. Um, but so God lays out a what to do if um, a husband suspects his wife of being unfaithful and he is to bring her to the, to the tabernacle, to the priest, and they are to take vows or oaths saying mm -hmm. i i've i've been faithful uh if not may god smite me and they are to take the dust of the floor of the tabernacle and drink it and if the wife has indeed been unfaithful it becomes a curse and mm -hmm. she will never bear children again i think is is that in the text or is that a goal <laughs> well it's um, implied because her the Bible is a little bit tactful. Her thighs, hint, hint, <coughs> mm -hmm. will rot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it probably means that nothing, nothing good is coming there again. Yeah. Yeah. Practical yeah. curse. <laughs> yes. Um, but if yeah. not. But if not, it she's totally fine and she'll bear children. Yeah. And so you can see in this um, punishment that Moses, on behalf of God, exacts of his people that the image here is of spiritual unfaithfulness. Israel was covenanted to be the Lord's um, in the way that marriage is a picture of. She was to be God's bride, and she played the whore with this golden calf. And yeah. so this this punishment could have been a curse, or it could have been fine. <laughs> but, well, except that they already had, they had already done it. <laughs> yeah. So, in in. in uh, that that sets up the, more of the context, or it helps to find the context. This is not God striking out blindly at some random people because they didn't quite get right the, the, the niceties of worship. This was his own bride, whom he had just bought by the blood of the Passover lamb, and from, and from whose enemies he had recently released them by great power and signs and terrors and wonders, he brought them here to make the marriage formal. In fact, Moses is on his way down with the marriage contract, the Ten Commandments. And in the face of that, they go after. 
and and this is, I think, something to think about in our generation. They don't go after another deity as we would mm-hmm. think of that. That is, they did not say, well, maybe it's not Jehovah, maybe it's Allah or the God of the Deists. Or even Satan. Mm-hmm. One, they went after an animal, a calf. And two, it wasn't even a real calf. It was a thing. Mm-hmm. They devoted their covenant love and gratefulness and passion toward the image, a thing, of an animal. This is bestiality and worse. Mm-hmm. This is, and, and many times I have called um, idolatry, spiritual pornography. They did that and committed bestiality and adultery and faithfulness by turning away from God all at once. And, and maybe that helps those who are having trouble with this one. The sins they committed, if we saw them in a husband toward a wife, the faithfulness, bestiality, the pornography, we would say, yes, divorce is legitimate. And in fact, not enough. There ought to be civil penalties here. Now, not everyone believes in those. We get outraged at the guy, but we're questioning whether the civil government should do anything. But in, in the Old Testament, at least, there were civil penalties for these kinds of things. Uh, a man could not simply abuse his wife and then walk away with a divorce settlement. And God, being not like us at all, being the transcendent creator, uh, has every right to dispose of us as not only his bride, but his property. So we're back to we're back to the beginning. Do we believe that's who God is or not? If we don't, well then, okay, try to get away with it and see what God may or may not be able to do to you. But if we believe this, the argument should cease, mm-hmm. and we should bow in reverence bef- before a holy God who does not destroy his bride. And despite the, the suggestions of the jealousy ceremony, he does not render her sterile. She continues to have seed after this. Mm. In fact, God continues to um, use the Day of Atonement ceremony and the sin offerings to deal with this. And these, again, these are not mere things. These are pictures that are pointing forward to Jesus. And so something else that Dawkins and his friends do not understand is none of this is arbitrary. None of this is, well, God was having a good day, so he forgave them. But, to, but here God was having a bad day, so he didn't. You have to look into the purpose of these things as they point to Christ. And for that, we really do need the revelation of the New Testament. Mm-hmm. It's implicit in the Old, but not until we get to the, old, to the New Testament and begin reading backward do we fully understand how much these things were not simply God being arbitrary and having good days and bad days, but this was a settled purpose of God in terms of the redemption that he would accomplish in time and history. So... All right, we finally got to the Exodus. Would someone like to talk us through the judges? Oh, boy. Uh, I mean, really, I could talk through one generation, and then you would just need to (laughs) copy-paste. Well, go ahead. There's a generation that's faithful. They are chastened by God by having foreign powers oppress them in some sense. Normally, it's the Philistines. And this makes them remember all of a sudden that they have a God who has delivered them. Ah. And they they repent. God raises up a judge. The judge takes out the uh, the individual who is oppressing them, the, the leader or the nation uh, as a whole. And they return to worshiping the Lord. And the reason it keeps repeating so many times is that they don't bring in the continuity of the covenant. They don't pass it on to their children in a faithful way as a whole. Uh, There's always a remnant, of course, but that basically keeps happening. And you can look at that and say, well... God just keeps oppressing them every generation. Isn't he supposed to be loving? Like, wouldn't it be more effective to love them back to him? And mm. the answer is pretty much no, because he's been loving them this whole time and they left him for the false gods anyway. This is a very much a tough love circumstance that is happening. And he always provides deliverance as well. All right. And then that brings us 
to the days of Saul and Samuel, and particularly of David and Solomon. Emily falls to you. <laughs> How was God merciful to them? Uh, although it's easy to look and see, wow, that was kind of mean of God, wasn't it? <laughs> well, the, he was mean in that he gave them what he wanted, what what they wanted. They So they look around. They've been through this time of the judges, and they look at all the other nations and say, gee, they're better off than we are. God has been better to them than to us because we don't have an earthly king. So God, give us a king like the nations. Because clearly, we should be like them. <laughs> Which seems to run <laughs> counter to the entire lesson of the book of Judges. But I digress. <laughs> um, so God says, all right, but I'm, before I give you what you ask for, I am going to warn you. This king will exact burdensome taxes. He's going to take more of your money than I do. Um, he's going to take your sons and draft them into the military and make them his servants. Um, he's going to take your daughters and make them his servants. Um, he's going to take all your stuff and it's it's not going to be like, great. <laughs> and uh, they say, yep, we know. Give us a king. <laughs> and he does. He's like, okay, here's what you want. Um, and Saul is actually useful for a time. Like, I think that is in itself a, a mercy. Oh, yeah, That absolutely. he is... Um, a competent war leader and wins wins some battles for Israel. However, they they picked the guy who who looked the best, not the one who was most faithful to God. And he becomes a bad king and he defies God and leads Israel astray with his own personal idolatry and witchcraft. And instead of wiping out the whole country because their king has representatively led them into witchcraft, God says, it's okay, I'm going to rise up a new king, raise up a new king. And he brings up David, who was perfect in every way, right? <laughs> Wrong. No. Spoiler alert. <laughs> Spoilers. Even David was not Jesus. And so, the, I, I mean, I think that's a pretty exemplary example. <laughs> that's the word. <laughs> A pretty typical example. example of God's yeah. God's mercy in saying, yeah, you had Saul, you tried that, that was on your own. I'm going to raise up something better, especially from where you least expect it, the smallest tribe. But I feel like I've talked for a long time with somebody <laughs> else's turn now. <laughs> How do you think Greg feels? <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> well... Um... Jumping off what you just said, so God picked someone for them, and and He picked the best person He could, and the, the man after His own heart, the young shepherd boy David. But before we're done, David is going to he's going to first of all commit bigamy, exponentialized. Mm -hmm. He's going to commit adultery. He's going to order a hit on one of his own most faithful guys, murder. He's going to not involve himself in his family and let his kids grow up wild till they're raping and killing each other. Mm -hmm. He's going to demand a census to see how many people he has that brings down God's judgment in a very wrathful way. And this is the man after God's own heart. Well, this is what God had to choose from, and this was the best. So... <laughs> And, and yet God continues to use him. He makes a covenant and swears to him that his throne will endure forever. He will have a son who will reign forever. And that none of this is conditioned upon anything David has done or failed to do. This is God's free grant of mercy. Now, he does warn there will be chastisements along the way. And David himself has to lose four sons for full restitution for his crime against Bathsheba and Uriah. And yet God does, still does not abandon Israel. Along comes Solomon. We <laughs> thought David was bad with his however many wives he had, a dozen or so, I think. Solomon piles it up to a thousand. And in the end, that's he's marrying a wife a week. Uh, and so the gross disregard for women, the abusive attitude, just the cold, um, well, I've had my week with you. Go into the harem and find something useful to do. I'll probably never see you again. Have a nice life. 
uh, all of that, which <clears throat> nonetheless ended up in, with him sacrificing, probably just as a matter of state, but it doesn't matter. It's the same thing, offering worship, false worship to false gods. And yeah, we say that like it should be less of a bad thing because yeah. he's king and it's a formality. <laughs> yeah. Like that actually makes it worse. Because <laughs> God used him to write three books of the Bible and he did this. Mm -hmm. mm. It's not that like that God is going after the worst possible people. He is covenanting with people who have generally have great advantages. Not always. We don't know much about where Noah was, except that he stood in the messianic line. Abraham, we're told uh, in, in Joshua that his fathers were idolaters, and Jewish tradition says that Abraham's father was even an idol maker. So, you know, we go down through here. If we're looking for the perfect guy, we're not going to find him. <laughs> Nor did God. God comes to someone that he has prepared um, with, with life experience, and sometimes with training within the covenant, sometimes not. And in sovereign grace, picks this person and says, hey, you're coming with me. I'm going to use you, which is what he said to Eve. I'll put enmity between thee and the woman, he says to the serpent. I'm taking the woman off your side and putting her on mine. This is sovereign grace. And this is what we're seeing all the time. It's, well, God's standards are impossible. No one can live up to them. Yes, you are correct. <laughs> Thank you for pointing that out. And that, yet that has not stopped God from showing mercy. Yeah. And that doesn't make them wrong. Yeah. <laughs> it makes man sinful. Yeah. yeah. So after Solomon sins, the kingdom is divided. And from there, we can quickly trace the apostasy of Israel and of Judah. Israel, first of all, uh, the, the mark of the division between the northern and southern kingdoms is the north immediately adopts the worship of golden calves again. Yeah, mm -hmm. all that. And they um, reject David's line. They reject, they reject the promise of God to yeah. bring the, the eternal king. Yeah, they, they've got a better idea. They're going to go back to the old time religion before David, even before mm -hmm. Moses. That's mm -hmm. the golden calf thing. Mm -hmm. And they use Bethel and Shechem, which were key in God's relationships with the patriarch, but not what God had been up to lately. So they're going off on their own tangent. And But it, it, is, a, it is practical idolatry. It's a violation of the second commandment and thus of the first. And yet they endure for hundreds of years. God sends them prophets, messengers, lawyers of the covenants to say, this is what you've been doing wrong. You need to repent. And Israel rejects the prophets. And sometimes God intervenes and protects Israel from foreign nations, even when they have been unfaithful, sometimes even in the middle of their unfaithfulness. We, we know Ahab, who introduces Baal worship, which is even worse, because it often involved child sacrifice and, and other scandalous and, and wicked things. And yet there's a point where God comes to Ahab since doesn't send Elijah, because Elijah and Ahab were not on speaking terms at the time, but sends a <laughs> random prophet and says, uh, yeah, the Syrians, they're bragging that, that, that their gods are better than mine, so um, that I don't control the hills. and they, you know, So you're going to win again, and you're going to win again. Just because you're my people, and my name's on the line here, so shut up and let me save you. Uh, this is not for your sake. No. <laughs> this is and, to teach the Syrians the lesson. <laughs> and yet, in the process, it does do good to Israel. If they will receive mm -hmm. it as such, but Ahab immediately rejects the favor, makes a league with the Syrians, and mm -hmm. God is not pleased. Uh, so, th th but the, the thing to stress here is the hundreds, let's see, I, 260 years is what uh, my notes say. Mm -hmm. Um, from the time of David and Solomon, where God keeps saying, this is it, you're going to die, but it doesn't come. It doesn't come in this generation, or the next, or the next, or the next, or the next. Uh, and and this, is, this is kind of what we want to hold up to Richard Dawkins and others who, who think that God is mean and cruel. Please understand, when the judgments came, centuries had passed, multiple, multiple generations had passed. Warnings from the prophets had passed. Miracles had passed. God had intervened and rescued his people time and again. So the question becomes, how much warning is enough warning to satisfy you? And why should what satisfies you matter? <laughs> yeah, the second part is really relevant. Who are you and why do you get to call time on this one? Mm -hmm. uh, there's a thing that happens to airline pilots as they set out on a trip across the Atlantic. The navigator will take his charts, or did in the age before computers, 
and would look at where they're flying and would do the calculations and would put down a point and circle and, and label it P and R, point of no return. Where is the point of no return? That's that's the point where <clears throat> for an air, an airliner, you might as well go on because it would take as much fuel to get back as to get there. Uh, and people have been looking at, you can look at Israel, but you can look at America and say, where's the point of no return? When does God's mercy run out? Mm. And it's easy to look superficially at the Old Testament, not add up the, the chronology, not figure out the generations that have passed, not count all the little Bible stories that no one knows, and say, well, that went real fast, and it all it's all in one book, and then God warned them a couple of times, and the destruction came. That point of no return came really early. No, it was hundreds of years and dozens of generations. And there was no point particularly for Israel, except maybe really close to the end where God says, this is it, it's over. Judah had a little more warning. We'll talk about Judah here in just a second. But time went on. And a lot of us, if it had been ourselves who were, who were offended, would have cut it off way before then. Mm-hmm. You know, the moment they turned to Baal worship, okay, that's just too much. We're, we're done. You're, you're sacrificing your children. No, that's, that's over the top. You're trying and that's to even the- justice, right? When yeah. when God says what to do in the case of adultery, yeah, basically the the wronged spouse has the right to prosecute to death, yeah, um, mm. and that's justice. That God doesn't do that is more merciful than He demands us to be. Exactly. Uh, part of the part of the argument here is. You don't know what you don't know our side. You have not heard our brief. You have not heard our arguments. You've just taken a superficial glance and seen that God sometimes punishes sinners, and you can't handle that. <laughs> That's not what the Bible says. It's not like that at all. And you look for the mercy. Well, you haven't read it, so you don't know it. Yeah. So we're we're, we're arguing in the air here. We're not talking about real Christianity. We're talking about your even superficial, it barely does justice with your imagined concept of what Christianity ought to be. Well, there's a, there's a quote somewhere about that where it, not, not specifically in relation to like arguing against Christianity, but it says, you know, 90% of social media is someone making up a guy and then getting angry about what he believes. <laughs> <laughs> Ain't that the truth? Yeah. And it's often true of the God of the Bible too. Yep. Well, the southern kingdom had its ups and downs. There were times when it fell into idolatry, and God would generally chasten them, rebuke them, let a foreign power come in and take their stuff for a little while. But they weren't as bad as the north, really, kind of, usually, uh, until maybe perhaps Athaliah came to the throne. But that was because the north and south intermarried, and things happened. But once we come out of that, we think, all right, that's we're never going to let that happen again, Right. The boy who was raised in secret in the temple because his uh, step-grandmother went psycho in her pursuit of Baal, he's going to understand how important faithfulness to God is, right? And as long as his foster father, the priest, was alive, he did great. But when Jehoiada died and the princess came and said, you know, let's, we've been really good long enough. Why don't we go have some fun and worship some other gods? Joash went right along with him even to murdering, martyring his foster father's son, Zechariah, who they slew between the temple and the altar. Uh, And yet God did not destroy Judah. God did not abandon. God said, look, I just rescued the whole promise of salvation by the life of a small boy uh, who was rescued by a princess and hid in a temple for seven years. And I gave him back to you as a king, and he's done wonderful things, and this is the thanks I get? More idolatry, more covenant unfaithfulness, more spiritual adultery? Why wasn't he done with them then? You know, a lot. I've unfortunately been in the position of knowing a lot of stories of failed marriages that ended in a divorce. And very few of them are of this character. Sometimes a wife will tolerate a husband who is sinful, given to pornography, even abusive, but it's because she's trapped or she has misplaced notions of of what being in love means or misplaced notions of what covenant faithfulness means. She does not... She, I've never heard a woman say, well, I know that God's going to change this guy. I have divine revelation 
And so I'm going to wait this out because better things are coming. God's promise. One, we don't got that. We, there's, there's no <laughs> such thing for anybody. And most sane women who are not, who do not feel trapped either by poor theology or because they don't know what to do next, will will leave. We'll walk away. We'll say, we'll, you know, shake off the dust of their feet behind them as they go. And, and rightly so. And yes, we're going to have to do uh, an issue on divorce someday. Mm-hmm. Uh, because God in the end will divorce Israel. But it takes a long time. But he's the one in charge. He's the victim only in the sense that he's the one sinned against. But he's in sovereign control and he could bring judgment at any time. This is committing adultery against the king who has all the information he needs and all the power he needs and all the law on his side. And yet he keeps showing mercy. And it's a very, very long time. In fact, I have the years here someplace. 125 years that Judah is given past Israel's destruction. Uh, We have the great revival under Hezekiah, but then things begin to go wrong. Hezekiah has a son named Manasseh, and he is the worst king that Judah ever has. He rebuilds the pagan altars. From the past, he reintroduces Baal worship. He practices ritual magic and witchcraft. He consults with a demon. He sends his children to the fires in the Valley of Hinnom. Uh, He sets up an Asherah idol in the temple, the very face of God. He sheds innocent blood very much till he filled Jerusalem from one end to the other. Blood that God said he would not pardon, and Scripture says he did wickedly above all that the Amorites did. He, He excelled the pagans in his wickedness. And at that point, God finally says, this is it. It's over. I will forsake the remnant of mine inheritance, deliver them into the hand of their enemies, and they shall become a prey and a spoil to all their enemies. This is from 2 Kings um, 24, it looks like. And yet God stayed his hand. <laughs> God says, this is the point of no return. But that doesn't mean we're ditching in the oceans right now. It means we the, the ship's going to keep flying. But know that it's there is an end now. It's it's not going to be this back and forth stuff. You're on your way down. It's just a question of how long. Manasseh is succeeded by his son Ammon, who reigns a short time and then picks up where Manasseh left off. Now, footnote about Manasseh: he's so bad that even the the overlord of Syrians can't stand him. They take him captive and throw him in a prison in Babylon, and there Manasseh repents. It for real. He actually. <laughs> Has a, has a near deathbed conversion. In his late old age, he comes back to God for real. And when he and he's reinstalled in his throne under God's mercies, and he tries to undo all the wickedness he's done, but there's not enough time, there's too much of it, and he dies. And his son goes right back to his idolatries. But he doesn't live very long. And then we Josiah comes to the throne. Anybody who is familiar with the Old Testament histories is going to heard of Josiah. Uh, the, the reformers love Josiah. Here's the king who takes reform in hand with passion <laughs> and whole heart. They like to compare uh, Edward the Sixth to yeah. Josiah, the, the young boy <laughs> the king, British who, Josiah. <laughs> yeah, who changes everything. And 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 you read what he did uh, from his youth. He begins to seek the Lord. He breaks down idols and false altars, desecrates the bones of the priests, cleans the temple, repairs it. In the process, some of his guys discover the temple copy of the law, the original document from which all copies should have been made. Apparently, they, someone apparently had hidden it when the bad kings were on the throne, lest they find it and, and destroy it. And having read it aloud, read it first personally that aloud, he says, wow, we are in a lot of trouble. So he renews the covenant, <laughs> reads the book before the people, and makes them all swear that they're going to seek God. Notice, makes them swear. Mm-hmm. And he <clears throat> identif- he intensifies and extends his reforms, cleanses the temple, destroys all the abominations left, gets rid of the sodomite prostitutes that were serving there. Ah. Uh, Isn't this also when the Feast of Booths is reinstituted? Like, I I thought I remembered reading. Was that somebody else? That's Maya. Yeah, that's after the the uh, captivity. After the captivity. Okay, sorry. The Feast of Booths, Tabernacles, gets highlighted left and right, both in the historical books and in Zechariah's prophecy. But Passover is. Passover. He holds holds the greatest Passover. Hezekiah's Passover was pretty wow. But they had had to hold it on the wrong day, the month later, the month the month for people who weren't ready for the first one, because they weren't ready. 
Mm-hmm. Josiah does it all right. It is the grandest Passover ever. And um, he goes beyond Jerusalem. He uh, eventually get, finally gets rid of the golden shrine calf in Bethel, carries his, re- his reforms out into what was left of Israel, um, destroys uh, the Valley of Hinnom, makes it a garbage dump, and thus a symbol of hell eventually. And we look at this, and it goes on for, whether you're reading Kings or Chronicles, it goes on for a couple chapters. You think, wow, this guy was where it was at. He he really loved the Lord. He really was passionate. He wanted, he wanted mm-hmm. first of all, to serve God, but he also wanted to save his people from their wickedness. All Surely commendable. this is rescue for Israel. Yeah. God, isn't God gracious in raising up this mm-hmm. young man? Yeah. He is. But we read at the end, notwithstanding... The Lord turned not from the fierceness of his great wrath, wherewith his anger was kindled against Judah, because of all the provocations that Manasseh had provoked him withal. Manasseh's reign proved to be the point of no return. And yet people will look and say, well, what, what's wrong with Josiah's reforms? Well, see, that's it. They were Josiah's reforms. People went along, Jeremiah or uh, Josiah carried them along, through his faith, charisma, passion, his force of will. He made it work, and no one dared stand up to him. But when he died prematurely at Arm- at uh, Megiddo, Armageddon, because he didn't listen to God at one key point, uh, things began to slide immediately. Megiddo, Armageddon, became the beginning of the end, the, down- the beginning of the downward spiral in Judah. We, we go through a handful of kings real fast, and then the Babylonians come. And as we it's look at like, Jeremiah... Go ahead. It's like Israel is this rubber band. That's this one way. And then every time there's a reform, it gets stretched out of place and it has to be stretched. And what happens as soon as that's over? It goes back to the way it was, which is what God is judging Mm -hmm. it for. Yeah. Yeah. Jeremiah, who lived during the time of Josiah and mourned his death, will write in chapter 3, verse 10 of his book, Judah hath not turned unto me with her whole heart, but feignedly, saith the Lord. Feignedly, that means pretending. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then in chapter 3, verse 25, Jeremiah, we lie down in our shame and our confusion covereth us, for we have sinned against the Lord our God, we and our fathers, from our youth even to this day, and have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God. And so Jeremiah looks back and he really sees no serious interruption of Judah's faithlessness. They, from our youth till now, we have sinned. And he doesn't really recognize any break in that pattern. And yet God has been faithful. God has been gracious. God has been merciful. God has not destroyed them. And even now, as we come to the end of all things, so it seems, God's going to take a remnant into captivity, and he's going to bring them back. The story's not over. This Judah's going to lose her temple and her autonomy, her political independence, and some of the outward props, the Ark of the Covenant will be gone and the tables of stone and the Shekinah glory as we come to the Restoration Era. And yet God still sends prophets. He still maintains the promise of Messiah. Messiah. They still have his word. In fact, he, he will very quickly finish up the Old Testament with his full revelation of Christ for that time. And yet even standing here at the death of Josiah, if you could be there and mourn Josiah's death, you could say, well, surely this is the end. Yes, in a couple generations. <laughs> it's still not. Fi- the ground does not open and swallow them all. The fire does not fall from heaven. There will still be several monarchs in quick succession, to be sure. <clears throat> we'll go through uh, at least one of Josiah's, since I forget if it's one or two, and then we'll, go, we'll default to his uncle's. Because one of his own sons is so wicked that mm-hmm. he's that's not happening. And we're, we're almost there, but we're almost there. God is still being gracious. He's still withholding judgment. And during this last little bit, he sends them Jeremiah, one of the longest prophetic books in Scripture, full of crying and weeping for the sins of God's people. God is not mm-hmm. sitting there gleefully waiting to drop a lightning bolt. Through his prophet, he mourns mm-hmm. their sins and what's mm-hmm. about to happen. So we come. We, we we haven't covered the material yet to come of the Restoration Era. That's next, I suppose, on our agenda after we go through the captivity. But I think we're we're at a point now where we can look back as we've done and say, "And do you think God wasn't merciful?" 
I think what they're, I think what these people are saying is God has a standard, he enforces it, and we resent that. Mm -hmm. No one should be able to tell me what to do. And no one should certainly be able to hold me accountable in any significant way. Because I'm a I'm a pretty good person. And I think my own judgments about myself, my autonomous self-judgments, are accurate enough. I may get some of the fine points wrong, but you know, close enough is close enough. And who is your God that he should say these mean things about me? What a bully. Yeah, that's kind of what Adam and Eve said in paradise, what Satan said before he fell. Um, you're not understanding who God is. And this is not a matter of intellectual ignorance, although that plays into it. This is a matter of unbelief, of contempt for the God who is. They, they say there is no God, and yet they hate him passionately. How dare he exist? How dare he tell me what to do? And yet God continues to be gracious because he gave Richard Dawkins life and breath and all kinds of good things and the ability to publish books and have lecture tours <laughs> where he could slap God in the face, as it were. And God can, I don't know, is Dawkins dead yet? I think he's still alive, isn't he? I think he's Richard still alive. Richard is, yes. He's yeah. still alive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So who knows? Maybe God yet will bring him to salvation. Mm -hmm. We can pray for that. Amen. Great. Shall we wrap up with some recommendations? <laughs> I'll recommend something. <laughs> Um, singing in the rain, <laughs> not the act of going out into the weather and opening your heart with song, but the movie Singing in the Rain. Although, I mean, if you want to go out in the weather and sing, that's probably good for your soul too. <laughs> yes. Um, but that's that's our sick day movie in our house is we watch Singing <laughs> in the Rain. Have you had a sick day? What brought it to mind? Uh, well, we did some time ago, not super recently, thankfully. Hmm. Um, but I think that was Gretchen's first musical. Oh, that's adorable. Oh, oh no, she did watch um, a couple of Disney musicals with Uncle Joseph and Aunt Talitha. So, <laughs> oh. Like <laughs> but it's the Beauty first, and the Beast? <laughs> yes, Beauty and the Beast and The Little Mermaid. Ah. Um, she she really liked Belle and the, the big yellow dress. Um, but I think Singing in the Rain was the first movie she watched at home. Mm -hmm. we, we don't watch a lot of TV. With her. We watch a lot of TV just after she goes to bed. <laughs> Brian, you got anything? You know, I, I, I had one thing that popped in mind and it left, but a new thing has replaced it. So I'll go with that one. <laughs> um, I recommend uh, in, in the tradition now on this podcast of recommending movies, of recommending Fantastic Mr. Fox. Oh, yes. So that good. is Emily's, my Emily's, mm -hmm. um, like probably her favorite movie i think it's it's that movie and it's knives out and they kind of edge oh. each other like so knives out is like right here mm. uh which i take a lot of pride in because i introduced that movie to her mm. um but fantastic mr fox is like her autumn has begun let's watch <laughs> this movie it's we watched it last year during our honeymoon as well like it was just <laughs> it's like autumn is here we have a week off let's watch it <laughs> My cousin used to read the book to me mm -hmm. uh, when I was very small. We would have our family reunion. We would all go camping. And I think it was in autumn in those days. It later switched to spring. But my cousin Anna would read Fantastic Mr. Fox to me. So when the movie came out, I was like, yes, it's that book. And it was worth it. You know, sometimes you, you love a book and then it's a movie and you're like, no, this is not at all the right experience. <laughs> but Wes Anderson did something good there. He did one of my one of my favorite quotes. We we Emily quoted it um, somewhere. I don't remember where we were, but there's like three characters. There's um, Mister Fox's uh, son, whose name escapes me. Ash. Um, Ash <laughs> Ash's cousin, whose name also escapes me. All of a sudden, Christopherson. Christopherson. <laughs> uh, and then like there's a third character that's um, Ash's lab partner. Oh and yeah. <laughs> The lab partner's female, and she's like really <laughs> Ash infatuated. Likes her. Yeah, Ash likes her, but she has like a crush on Christopherson because he's mm -hmm. popular and charismatic and athletic and all that. Mm -hmm. And so there's a point where it's like, "You're supposed to be my lab partner, Ash. I am. No, you're not. You're, you're disloyal. People. Yeah, disloyal. Oh. That's the word." <laughs> 
Well, I've never seen this movie, nor I didn't even know till now it was a book. Oh, yeah, Roald Dahl. <laughs> because I don't know, I've always been presented it without context. It's always, oh, it's my favorite. People either seem to love it or hate it. Mm. And so I always get come in on the end of the conversation and, okay, this is the first really good, you need to see this recommendation I've ever heard. So I'll have to mm -hmm. seriously consider this maybe over Thanksgiving or over Christmas. I feel like it occupies a similar space in children's movies, mm -hmm. although it's not really a children's movie. It could pass as a children's movie, as Oh Brother, Where Art Thou occupies <laughs> in like regular movies. I don't know. There's, <laughs> they're in the same mental drawer for me. I don't know why. No, no, no. That that makes sense. Yeah. Um, to my uh, film nerd discredit, I actually have not seen No Brother Where Art Thou yet. Oh my goodness! I you know. need to watch it. But um, they definitely have a similar vibe mm -hmm. somehow. Yeah, despite being totally different. Directors. Completely different directors. Mm -hmm. uh, Coen Brothers did that one, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's really weird to me. Like they they have a, a surprisingly diverse filmography as far as theme goes yeah and it's weird because like i haven't seen a lot of the coen brothers but every one of theirs that i've seen is like in my top 10 movies <laughs> so like true grit oh brother where are oh, thou that's right i forget um, what other ones they've done but i've loved everyone hail caesar no country for old men if i remember correctly, that one i, I haven't them. watched yet but i've been told i would like the book so I need the book to is very good that. um it's 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 um it's nihilistic because it's Cormac mm -hmm. McCarthy right. uh, as an author, uh, so it's kind of like, oh you know, this is this isn't like there's no there's there's not really a line where they verbatim say there there's no country for old men here <laughs> you know like roll credits but um it's very much a there are no more good men there's no mm -hmm. more righteous hero cowboy types uh, everyone is morally corrupt everyone is evil in some straight. sense each one has turned to his own way <laughs> it's very romans one actually now that you say it that way <laughs> uh but very very interesting well great you have a recommendation <sighs> something in me <clears throat> wants to follow up your uh, your movie recommendations with it's a wonderful life, oh. which ah. I really, which I really do love, uh, and most people hate. For it's me, Jimmy it's a mood. I have to be in the right mood. Yeah, Otherwise, you got to be in the really right mood. And, but it's I Jimmy have Stewart. Mixed feelings, you know, because like on the one hand, I think it's a great story. There's a there's another hand where it's like I have seen this movie probably an average of twice a year for most of my childhood. Mm, yeah. Uh, Twice every season, that is. Right. Yeah. And it, and then there's a third hand that grows out of my chest that is like, <laughs> and it was used at your old church for like sermon illustrations, like an entire <laughs> "It's a Wonderful Life" themed sermon, and it's just like that. That has a weird connotation in my head. <laughs> <laughs> well, you see, I said I would, I would, I would kind of like to, and part of me does. It lacks the gospel. Mm. Um. I mean, you can read it in between the lines if you try real hard, but there's no blood of Christ, and it's about being a good man. The um, but the themes that any man is wealthy who has friends. There, for a Christian, there's a great deal of truth in that, mm -hmm. and that God uses us in ways we will never see nor understand, perhaps till Judgment Day, mm -hmm. is also a good thing to consider. It's easy to look at your life and say, "What have I done?" What have I done for God lately? What have I done of, of lasting impact? Uh, and sometimes we find we don't even measure up to Jimmy Stewart's standards. At least he <laughs> did a lot to help the character, did a lot to help people in practical ways, like get their houses, have their homes. And the, the end where he gets some small sense of what he's really done is kind of tear-jerking. Uh, but it does like the gospel, and having that be a Christmas movie is kind of like putting your other favorite Christmas movie as Die Hard. Which <laughs> that, that is my other favorite yeah, Christmas movie. I mean, what's wrong with that? <laughs> oh, is it? Did you post this on our on our website at one point? The, the little meme of "Let's get this straight." Yes. Uh, Die yeah, Hard yeah, was officially exchange. declared a Christmas movie yes. at the Council of Nicaea. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> but uh, leaving those two semi-recommendations behind, I'm going to recommend having a forest, a garden in your house. Mm. I'm looking over here at all the plants that my uh, wife and girls are are nurturing, and I kind of just take them for granted and visually don't even see them. <laughs> but they're right here to the left of uh, my computer. And there are a lot of them. And I grew up at home where there were plants. And even as a little kid, I was given a sweet potato plant to take care of. <laughs> and um, with this goes having pets. That was actually what I had thought about earlier. You know, we're told from the beginning to have dominion over the lesser creation. And Adam was a gardener, but he was also told, look after the animals. Mm -hmm. It is part of human nature of what God made us for, to have, to live in gardens and to have pets. And these, if we have, it's one thing if you can't make it work where you are, but to have the hard attitude that says, our oh, plants are just, you know, weeds and animals are, are just nuisances and work on that. That's not the way God designed things. And so a little bit of practice here may prepare you better for eternity because there's nothing, it's, it, my wife was pointing out, I think just yesterday, it's a Gnostic heresy to say that there will be no animals in heaven. Mm -hmm. God mm -hmm. made animals, and part of who we are is defined in terms of taking care of them. And God made us gardeners, and we should expect that that will continue. So mm -hmm. getting some practice in now is not only um, good for the immediate environment of your home, but it's also good spiritual training. Mm -hmm. There's My, a really oh. timeless commencement speech, not commencement senior convocation speech that was given at Hillsdale before I was even there. Um, Dr. Justin Jackson delivered it, but he speaks on the little prince and mm. he tells the story of his little daughter who had a goldfish that died. And the the little girl goes, so my, my goldfish that I was taking care of, it's, it's dead. Daddy will, will the cat die? And he goes, yeah. <laughs> will, will daddy die? Yep. Daddy's going to die. How about the dog? Will the dog die? <laughs> and he says, well, you can see where I stand in the lineup, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and what about mommy? Will mommy die? Yep. Can I have another fish? <laughs> she says, There's something about humanity that we want to take care of. We, we want a goldfish to take care of, to feed yep. and to clean the water. And Anyway, it, it ties into the little prince and it's really beautiful. You can find it on YouTube. But sorry, that was a tangent, but very much supporting what you said about in in the same sense. In the same sense, um, my my wife and I refer to our garden out back as uh, as the the adjective Edenic mm -hmm. because it is. It's very much like this little. At least during summer. Now it's all mostly dead, but um, <laughs> during summer, anyway, it's this very lush um, spot with with big green leaves and. Um, we just brought in our harvest of butternut squash, and we got like Ooh. ten of them. Wow! Uh, it's it's going to be great winter for soups. That's all I can say. <laughs> awesome! Thank you guys so much for this conversation. It's nice to run through the entire history of sinfulness <laughs> <laughs> and grace. And grace. <laughs> That's the, the flip side. But Jesus is so gracious to us, and um, we can be so thankful. Um. We are thankful to God also for you, our listeners. Thank you for tuning in. Um, we're so glad to be able to share this podcast with you. Um, we'd love to hear from you. If you want to send us an email, um, you can reach us at haltingtowardsion at gmail.com. Um, we are also very thankful for our financial supporters. Um, this probably wouldn't be happening mm -hmm. if not for your help. Um, so if you'd like to join our number, you can visit our website, anchor.fm slash haltingtowardsion, or our Patreon, patreon.com slash haltingtowardsion. I feel like I forgot. Oh, my lawfully wedded husband. Thanks to David, our producer, <laughs> and my lawfully wedded husband. <laughs> See you next time.